Thank you, Damon. And welcome everyone to our uh, fourth and final panel that will feature success stories in forest products businesses. I'd like to introduce, introduce Mr. James Gaspard with Biochar Now. James began his venture with Biochar when searching for a sustainable and cost-effective solution to removing beetle kill pine trees from his private property in Northern Colorado. In 2009, testing began on his patented kiln design that generates high quality carbon from waste wood, such as wildfire salvage, pallet materials, and municipal waste. James has since built Biochar Now as a green waste disposal company that supplies customers globally with high quality carbon of the highest purity in the industry. James? All right, All right. can you hear me? And what I do, hit share screen? Yes, sir. All right. All right, can you see my PowerPoint? All right, yeah, I'm not the expert of technology. So anyway, I appreciate the invitation to speak here. I appreciate everything that uh, the industry has done to help support our company here in Colorado, Tim Reeder and that bunch. In fact, we were one of those recipients, recipients of the loan he was speaking about. We have paid it off in full, so we're happy to, happy for that as well. Um, but my talk, if you Google biochar, you'll get a million hits. And uh, this, my talk was, it was basically be about our company and our carbon. Because out of those million hits you, you get, we're basically the only biochar company that's formally approved by the US EPA for unrestricted use. So that ought to give you a handle of what this wild, wild west is in our industry. Anyway, so we are, this is a electron microscope photo of our carbon. Okay, this was made out of beetle kill pine. It's, you see how clear it is. Where we differ from other people, we basically have a patented technology where we take the carbon or the wood up to temperature in a vacuum environment for eight to 10 hours. Many of the other companies that aren't approved by the EPA, in fact, all the other companies that aren't approved by the EPA, they basically go a different route where they don't keep it at temperature near this amount of time. And if you look at their electron microscope photos, you'll basically still see tars and lignans and other things still left in those pores. Now, just a tablespoon of our product will contain over 400 square meters of surface area. Now, what we do as well, <clears throat> the government labs have estimated the half-life of our carbon in the ground at 17,000 years. So, and then also the USDA labs have reported back to us that we're also the only carbon they can find that has both cation exchange properties and anion exchange properties in its raw state. So we can basically bind heavy metals, salts, nutrients. We actually have patents on binding nutrients and stopping algae blooms. We also have patents on treating mine wastewater, both in the US and in Canada. Uh, we've been at this quite a while. We service a lot of large corporate clients is what we service. Now we have over 13 major markets and we're expanding around the world. We, uh, we uh, this presentation here, I gave over the weekend, I was in Oklahoma visiting with the Indian conference and they were more focused on remediation and on uh, hemp. Uh, they're getting into hemp that's to help with the remediation. But, uh, you know, so I'll go in depth in those two markets, but also other markets we have um, include plastic filler, concrete filler, um, a lot of different, um, you know, the algae removal, of course. We're shipping a lot of product down to Florida this time of year. We're uh, just shipping out. We got a massive order the other day from North Miami Beach to stop a red tide outbreak, and we're shipping product down for that. Uh, we're also getting orders even from the Northern Lakes, and uh, we've got a lot of work in there. We have a lot of national lake treatment companies work with us. So there's a lot of different markets we've already tested, and we supply in those markets. But on the remediation side, 
you can see our, our carbon in the raw state can pick up a lot of different heavy metals. Uh, and we pick them up very well. In fact, we're in the process of, I've already been notified this week of winning a $35 million uh, order uh, from one mining company to clean up a mess they have. We're used in an awful lot of Superfund locations. One of the things we're working with with the Indians is a uh, very large the lead and arsenic and um, zinc issues, Superfund sites on, their, on some of their reservations. So we're recognized in this manner because we have both the cation and anion exchange properties. We've been approved Texas Railroad Commission to clean frack water spills because we can bind like in the Permian area, when they have a spill, it's really salty water. We can bind the salts as well as the chemicals. So that gives them a leg up on using our product. Not listed on this chart is we also bind PCBs, dioxins, mercury, uranium. We actually got a project. We're just about to start uranium on a, on a tribal land. Uh, and so on the mercury side, I can speak to that. There's a lot of our projects I can't speak to because they're embroiled in litigation and you have to sign an NDA even to work on the damn things. But uh, so what happened, the DuPont, we worked with DuPont to clean 300 miles of river that was mercury polluted in Virginia, and they made it public, uh, so I can speak to that. So what happened with DuPont was they tested all the carbons they could find in the world. We were judged to be five times more effective at binding mercury than any other carbon they could find. We were a fraction of the cost of the other carbons. It was all made from Colorado beetle kill pine. We shipped it out there. They were able to remediate the mercury pollution for pennies on the dollar, where before, this pollution had been occurring, it occurred in 1929 to the 1940s. And it, everybody knew it was there, but it wasn't being cleaned up for the simple fact it was too expensive. But because of the, you know, the forest products coming out of Colorado made into our carbon, they were able to afford the cleanup. So this is just one example. Uh, nutrients. We also, as I said, we actually have patents on stopping algae blooms. We bind phosphorus in our raw state uh, 99%. There's been a lot of publicity on some of this stuff here lately that we're doing. There's a massive lake in New Jersey where they put out press that they put, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of our product in the lake for testing and we removed 80% of the phosphorus. So, uh, and that's from a massive lake body, you know, so now they're just putting out more to get the rest of it. But this is where we shine on the algae removal. And we've been used in massive projects throughout Florida. Uh, Cape Coral used us, they have 400 miles of canal. And basically we were used to remove the uh, algae from those canals. As I said, we're shipping down to North Miami Beach now on another project. We've got projects all over North America cleaning up algae. And the cost is pennies on the dollar. I mean, literally you can clean up a lake for thousands of dollars instead of millions of dollars. Now on ag, everybody shoots for yields. What we do with ag is we're like a battery in the soil. We're a totally inert product, but we bind the nutrients, we bind the fertilizer that you put into the soil so it won't leach out. We've got test data showing you could put 120 inches of rain through our char or rinse it with our char and the nutrients will not leach out. So they're bound in our char until the plant roots come down and through the cation exchange property, they release the uh, nutrients. So this is an old study that was done. The results were spiked in the sense that Cornell did the study in the worst possible soils. The soils were clay soils. They rained every day. There was no nutrients in it, totally sterile soils. So, you know, but they planted maize corn, the control plot, you know, it wouldn't produce. The fertilized plot had some, uh, some yield, okay? The biochar plot with 10% by volume, it had an 880% yield improvement over the fertilized plot. Now that was because that just shows how bad the nutrients washed out, okay? But having said that, we've been supplying the cannabis and hemp industry and specialty ag all over the country. Uh, we actually just got some studies back uh, from Canada 
where just 1% of our product in the soil increased barley growth over 200%, um, you know, in peas, double digits. Uh, the can cannabis and hemp guys, they all put about two to 3% in the soil and they all get two to 300% yield increases. So we, we've got a lot of large corporations that we work with now. We supply two of the top four national lawn care companies and they've got test data shows one and a half percent by volume in the turf zone will more than double your biomass growth. So this has been repeated over and over again, um, you know, with major corporations. This is one example, Bartlett, uh, tree is one of our large clients. These were tree roots. Um, if you know Chicago, Old Town Chicago, Milwaukee Avenue, it's now ethnic neighborhoods, but they have concrete trees, you know, trees in the concrete sidewalk and they weren't growing. So they added just a little bit of our carbon on in there and then you get the massive roof growth and then the trees became healthy and, you know, life was good for them. We also have disease suppression properties. We don't cure diseases. This was studies done by Bartlett as well. And they're like a billion dollar lawn care company. Um, we also, this was Phythophthora, which is the Irish potato famine disease. We also have gotten test data on blight, on greening disease, and a lot of other, the high dollar, or the diseases that call this is a lot of loss in the commercial agriculture, because you've got to, there's a lot of dead trees out there, guys, and you got to have massive markets to take this carbon. So that's what we chase is the massive markets. This is an example on hemp seedlings. I was speaking to the hemp guys over the weekend. You can see the one on the left had 1% biochar in that mix. You can see the great greater root growth. And then so basically here they swap positions, but you can see where the bio, where it starts growing that much quicker because healthy roots equal healthy plant. All right, uh, now just to real quickly close on some of this stuff. With the new administration, we have our phones ringing off the wall. Everything we produce is receives carbon credits. And a lot of people have come in here lately, press people. Colorado Public Radio did a segment on us because we can take the dead stuff out of the charred trees out of the forest. We can. We take the slash, we convert it into carbon, lock up the carbon, you know, they, we hit all the hot buttons in the press. So Colorado Public Radio did a piece on us a few weeks ago. It was picked up by National Public Radio and changed the focus to national issues. And so we, out of that, we've already got sites committed with major lumber companies, major landowners. I've had to go to Oregon, walk through the charred trees in Oregon, I've been through the Cameron Park fire area. We can use all that material that people can get it to us. Uh, in fact, we're just having to form our own logging company because let's just say the logging industry here is not that competitive, but uh, we do pay good money for uh, logs. We pay more for charred logs than the sawmill pays for salt timber. We're trying to be a good member of the community uh, and make the dollars go further in treatment dollars. One of the things the administration did, though, and that's why I highlighted this to the Indian tribes, uh, they created NRCS 808, and 20 states have approved it. Uh, even the ones that approved it don't know what the hell it is, but that's another story because it's brand new. Uh, the other states are working toward approving it, but what it is is they'll actually pay a farmer to put our carbon in the ground. So if we can't give the stuff away, you know, then I've got to fire my salespeople. But um, what it amounts to is most NRCS programs, it's a ranked program, and most programs award money if you can hit two or three items. There's 47 resource concerns. Our product hits 32 of them. So anybody that turns in the paperwork properly documented goes to the top of the list. And these are sort of the categories of soil, water, uh, you know, we bind pesticides, we do all that. Um, air, plants, animals. We don't do anything in energy, but I mean, it is what it is. I mean, it can't be perfect. Now, real quick, I'll just talk, talk through another couple of issues. We're actually the only carbon that's formally approved by the USDA as an organic animal feed additive. Um, 
we're, you know, so we have a large market there. We're working with major uh, feed companies in that arena. Uh, the plastics, we're working, we can more than double the strength of plastics and cut the weight in half. And we can strengthen the land, the stuff that goes to the landfill to such a point. We are sitting on, uh, I mean, we're working on major contracts in all these areas. And when I say major, I'm talking in the billions of dollars. Uh, so we're, you know, we have a real need to have access to charred trees around the country or junk trees or dead trees. The reason we need the dead is we, our process uses the wood itself as the energy source. And if, if the wood is over 20% moisture, basically we use up all the energy in the wood driving off the moisture. So if there's an area, like I know we're in discussions in Arizona to get rid of trash trees down there, the, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the site, uh, you know, the pinyon juniper, the tamarisk, we can use any kind of wood source. Okay. Uh, we're in discussions in Texas to get rid of the cedar trees. Uh, in Kansas, I just came back from Kansas and Oklahoma. They have issues with invasive cedar. So we can use any kind of wood uh, in any area. It just depends what that wood is. And I've got to go to Florida next week Next week, to we're putting some sites down there to deal with the hurricane blowdown. Uh, so we can make, we can turn that, we can pay 60 bucks a ton for junk and make and still do well. So anyway, I thank Tim in the Colorado program to support us at the beginning. I look forward to working with many of the people on this call as we clean up local forests and uh, get rid of the dead and make it marketable. We don't depend on grants, you know. Um, it's a business here. And if you're depending on grants, you're not sustainable. Uh, we have good margins. We've been funded. Uh, we're expanding worldwide. We're putting sites in Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, New Zealand, um, and throughout the US. Our emissions are extremely clean. We've been permitted to go into California, Texas, North Carolina, and we've got a list of sites after that. And, uh, but anyway, I thank you all for the time and I look forward to any questions later. Thank you very much, James. We really appreciate that excellent presentation. There's a number of uh, questions in the Q&A box and we'll try and get to some of those when we get finished. So thank you again, James, really appreciate it. Our next speaker is Tim Kato, and he's the resource forester for Montrose Forest Products. And Tim is originally from La Crosse, Washington in Whitman County, where his parents were wheat farmers. He attended Oregon State University and graduated with a BS in forest management in 1983. After graduation, he was hired by Louisiana Pacific Corporation as a forester. Over his 20 years with LP, he worked in their mills in Oregon, Idaho, and Colorado. LP sold its sawmills to Riley Creek Lumber in 2004, and Tim worked for this company in North Idaho until Riley Creek Lumber combined milling operations with Bennett Lumber in 2007 to form a new company called Idaho Forest Group. Tim worked for Idaho Forest Group as a procurement forester until his retirement in May of 2018. In the spring of 2019, he was contacted by Montrose Forest Products to take over their timber procurement department as resource forester. His main role is buying timber sales from the U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and private landowners, as well as supervising the logging of these sales. Montrose Forest Products purchases and logs approximately 42 million board feet of logs annually. Tim represents Montrose Forest Products on several collaborative, collaboratives and organizations. So welcome Tim and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Well, thanks uh, for that nice in, in, uh, introduction and uh, Damon, I guess you're going to run my slideshow for me. Um, so you might want to turn the volume down because there is some video in this as well. I, I want to thank uh, Tim Reeder, uh, who invited me to, to speak here. Uh, Montrose Force Products is a family-owned operation, a subsidiary of Nyman 
Enterprises, which is based out of the Black Hills. The Nyman family own now five sawmills uh, in four different states. Colorado is <clears throat> further south that they go, and this is their only what we call a stud mill combination board mill. And I'll be able to show you that as we go through the slideshow. So uh, the facility here in Montrose has been on site since either the late 50s or the early 60s. There's been a sawmill on this site for over 60 years. Um, and for the last almost 20 years, this mill has been predominantly cutting dead uh, spruce and lodgepole killed from either the mountain pine beetle attacks uh, north of I-70 here in Colorado, or more recently, the spruce uh, beetle attacks that have really devastated like the Rio Grande National Forest and the Eastern Grand Mesa uh, and Compagre and Gunnison National Forest. So why don't we go to the next slide? Okay. So Nyman Enterprises now has, uh, as I said earlier, five mills, uh, one in Hewlett, uh, Wyoming, Spearfish, South Dakota, Hill City, South Dakota, Gilchrist, Oregon, which is our latest purchase, and now, of course, in Montrose, Colorado. Next slide. Here in Montrose, we predominantly, as I said, we cut Engelman spruce, lodgepole pine, subalpin fir, and we make those into studs, either two by four or two by six. And now we're We've converted the mill to also be able to cut ponderosa pine into boards, which is four quarter or one inch boards. Next slide. 94% of our timber supply comes from federal lands, Forest Service. We do buy a little bit from the BLM and occasionally we'll be working with private landowners, but our log supply is very, very dependent on the US Forest Service. Next slide. We cut about 42 million board feet annually on a what's called a super shift. We run five 10 hour days, Monday through Friday, and about every other Saturday we run an eight hour shift. So it's kind of a, call it a super shift. If you try to put 42 million board feet into perspective, that's about 6,000 loads of logs per year. We work with 10 independent logging contractors <clears throat> and our logging base is something around 50 men working for these different independent companies. We also have around 50 independent log trucks delivering to the mill annually. We do not run company logger logging sides. We do it all with uh, subcontractors. Next slide. So the annual cost of logs to the mill fluctuates um, uh, annually, as you can imagine, <clears throat> based on distance, based on um, you know, uh, just uh, conditions out in the woods. But in 2020, calendar year, we actually spent about $14 million on our logs for that 42 million to get it to the mill. Next slide. Here at the mill, we employ about 93 people. And uh, that's, that's including uh, salary and hourly staff, uh, including the office staff. Um, so it's a pretty good sized chunk of people for a small community like Montrose. Next slide. This is a map that kind of shows you our working circle. Uh, where Montrose would be dead center in the middle of this circle. So you can see that we can reach out at almost to Steamboat Springs to the north on the White River National Forest. We can reach over into the Pike San Isabel, uh, probably east of Salida a ways. Certainly the Rio Grande down into the Monta Vista country south, incorporating basically all of the San Juan National Forest. And of course, uh, the Geomug National Forest in the center, which is our home forest. <clears throat> Occasionally we will reach over into the Manny LaSalle National Forest in Utah to draw some fiber in. So you're looking at a working circle range of about 250 to 275 miles in radius. Uh, next slide. So now we're gonna just, I'm gonna take you th virtually through our mill. Um, this is just a picture of our log yard uh, with the front end loader moving a bite of logs up to the live deck. So next slide. Jim Nyman and his family purchased the Montrose Mill in 2012. Uh, 
Uh, it had been through several ownerships um, and unfortunately some receiverships and even bankruptcy in the, in the past here through the different ownerships. But in 2012, uh, the Nyman family picked it up and we're gonna show you what they've done over the last eight years. Next slide. This is our live deck where we are loading logs uh, to feed them into the mill. We actually have two uh, sides of uh, what we call a large log side and a small log side. So this machine uh, will separate by diameter. Once uh, basically for 12, 14 inches and bigger on the butts will go to the large side and the smaller logs will go to the sharp, sharp chain or small log side. Next slide. For the studs, we actually cut eight, nine, and 10 foot studs, either two by four or two by six. And so this is just our chop saw that's bucking the logs into the different lengths that we make for studs. Next slide. Here you see our sharp chain, um, which is the small log side, uh, just cutting, cutting the logs down and kind of taking the jacket sides off, squaring it up a little bit so then it'll head to the resaw. Next slide. We start to talk about innovation um, in sawmilling. And one of the most important things, in my opinion, that has changed in sawmilling over my career is what we call optimization, or computers actually scanning and reading logs that can tell us uh, the best way to cut those logs, what's the most lumber we can get out of them. And this is part of the investment that the Nyman's started to make early on was putting in these computer optimization systems throughout the mill. This is a, at the sharp chain or the small log side, this was a roughly a million dollar upgrade in 2013, 2014. Next slide. This is a large head rig. It's an old, almost a, a shotgun system, we call it. Um, it's been here for a long time. And uh, uh, this was also optimized at the same time as the small log side. So next slide. It's just a closer picture. It's hard to kind of see what we're doing here, but there's just a very large band saw there. And what you're looking at is the carriage that goes back and forth and uh, moves the log through that band saw to break it down into uh, sizes that we can start making lumber out of. So next slide. Here is the large log head rig optimization. This is a kind of a printout here. It shows you what the computer tells the, the sawmill operators to how they can cut and maximize lumber out of that, out of that log based on its diameter, shape, and so forth. This was also, again, about a million dollar upgrade. Uh, next slide. This is the gang saw edger. <clears throat> My numbers here are, I made a mistake on this. It was actually $1.5 million investment. Uh, this is a gang saw that breaks those cants down and just saws them into the lumber. And it is also optimized. Next slide. <clears throat> we think that this was probably one of the most critical things that the Nymans did for Montrose. Um, if you recall back in, oh, starting in probably 2010 through 2015, particularly in British Columbia, there was a series of sawmill explosions. Um, BC was dealing with the same kind of problems Colorado was dealing with, which was salvaging lodgepole pine. And it's that dust that uh, very similar to an elevator, grain elevator explosion, that it actually took some lives and it, and it just destroyed, I think it was three sawmills in about a two year period. It was pretty brutal. And it said that, that fine dust that you get from dead, dead wood so this dust collection system was an early thing that Jim Nyman put in and it removes fine dust from the sawmill to just reduce that spontaneous combustion. And it was about a $500,000 investment, but extremely important to the, the durability and safety here at this mill. Next slide. This is just showing you a little bit as, as it comes out of the gang edger. Um, uh, just kind of the lumber coming out. These guys are feeding it into the trim saws here, or the, the rip saws. And then you see on the right, the lumber coming out on the other end. Next slide. Uh, this is the 
gang saw head here um, in feed system. So this is just manual. Um, the, these cants come down from the right side and they slide, uh, as you can see, onto these rollers. And then an operator is standing here and he'll feed them, kind of push them into the to the gang saw in feed. And then that's where we're breaking this, this cant down into either two by fours or two by sixes, depending on the thickness. Next slide. This is where they come out of the drops, drop out to the sorter out of that, uh, out of that gang saw in feed. Next slide. <clears throat> we put in a lumber sorter in uh, 2013 that uh, in 14, that was a huge investment. It was a $15 million investment. This is at the back end of the mill. This included trimmers, sorters, the stacking line or J sorter, which, re which replaced the old hand uh, green chain. Um, and then of course it was all optimized with scanners to maximize the lumber and, and uh, you know, trim the boards up to make sure that they're of quality. So this was a major investment about, about a year or two after Jim bought the mill. Next slide. This is the trimmer optimizer. You can see the screen on the upper left corner. It's reading uh, the boards as they just at a rapid speed um, as they pass under this optimizer to tell us just exactly what to trim this board into what length, um, whether it's a eight, nine or 10, or maybe even as we do cut seven foot, even six foot, even down to four foot for, for pallet stock. Next slide. And this is the trimmer out feed. Um, I think if we go to the next slide, you'll see it moving. And one more. <laughs> there you go. So this is the actual speed um, that that board. This is a, there's a series of saws under that uh, canopy there that are cutting these boards um, per the length that the optimizer told it to. So you can see how fast it's it's actually moving when when the sawmill is running good, <laughs> which <laughs> doesn't do it all the time. And that's the outfeed. Next slide. This is a trash return to the chipper. You know, when you're cutting dead wood, boy, do you have a lot of waste. Um, in some cases, this last year, we were looking at waste in the neighborhood of 40% of the scale volume of a log was, was just unusable, uh, given the age and the condition of the wood that was coming in from this dead salvage sale. So it was imperative to improve our conveyance to the chipper to handle this material. And this was a cost of about 150 grand back in 2016. Next slide. <clears throat> we dry our boards um, in a kiln. Uh, all, the, all the lumber is dried in the kiln. These are a little older kilns when we bought the mill. So Jim's family spent about $2 million upgrading this. Uh, back in 2013. We are now planning to upgrade it again to be able to uh, uh, handle the more green wood that we are going to be moving into now, both in spruce, lodgepole, and ponderosa pine. We realize that we're going to need more kiln capacity. Right now, to dry, when, you, when, the, when the kilns are fully charged or full, this dead lumber, you can dry it in about eight to 10 hours which is pretty incredible. That tells you how low moisture there is in the log coming in. When you move over to green logs, you're looking at anywhere from 36 to 48 hours to dry. So you can just see we're gonna need more capacity. And that's on, the, that's on the plans for, I think, either this year or next to really start ramping up and building more kiln capacity. Next slide. So the big project that began in 2019 was a new planer, a state-of-the-art planer building, that uh, facility that kind of came about after long discussions with the San Juan National Forest in 2017 and 2018. As you know, they have a very large component of ponderosa pine down there. Nyman's basically cut nothing but 
Ponderosa Pine up in the Black Hills and in Oregon. So they're probably one of the premier companies that really understand and, and can manufacture pine in a, in a profitable way. So it was a logical step for Jim Nyman and the family to get together with the Forest Service down there where there was an in interest in increasing management because of the active pine beetles that they have down there, which includes the roundhead beetle, the mountain pine beetle, and the western pine beetle. And they really didn't have a market for it of any size or scale. So through just some talks, uh, there was, they kind of worked together and convinced uh, the company to go ahead and put in a, a facility that could handle a large volume of ponderosa pine, maybe as much as half of our annual production, 20 million feet a year. And so as a result, we needed a new planer and that's what this project started in 2019. Um, next slide. This just shows you stages of the construction. Next slide. And the planer interior now, and we'll go through the planer here virtually, but the, the whole cost of this project was $20 million. Uh, and I should state that all of these numbers I'm telling you, none of this is grant money. This is strictly from wasn't any grants or, or support from many organizations or government agencies. Next slide. This is a planar tilt hoist. You can see that these on the left here, these are units of lumber that have now been dried. They've come out of the kilns and we move them into Can you hear me? Did I, yeah, I, can, did hear I, you I can hear you now, Tim. Okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> Froze for a while. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I hate that when that happens. Uh, so I'm going to take you from the planer uh, in feed. Uh, next slide. This is just the lumber that's that's now come off of that unit. It's moving down the conveyor table to the planer. Next slide. This is the actual planer itself. This is a brand new one. Um, it runs at about uh, 1500 lineal feet per minute, which is pretty fast. Next slide. And if you click this, I think one more slide, you'll see the speed that this is coming out at. So next slide, there you go. So this is the slowdown line. Um, it's really shooting out of there. And uh, this is how we slow it down. You just start kind of using these reverse conveyors to, uh, to make sure it doesn't go shooting out through the wall, which can happen. <laughs> and we've seen that before. Um, you probably go to the next slide. This is our scoreboard. It just tells us kind of our production for the day. Uh, it gives us just, uh, it's just a readout of how much lumber basically in board feed were, or number of pieces that we're, uh, we're doing in, a, 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 in real time. So this just is always updating as every board goes through. Next slide. So this is the planer trimmer and sorter line. And again, it's got a J sorter similar to the one in the sawmill where the lumber is sorted by dimension and grade and length um, on the right there. And uh, then we can, we stack it in uniform units. Next slide. This is the trimmer line itself. Again, optimized all the way through. Next slide. We installed a automatic planer grader on, on, this, on this new planer. In the old days, 
and a lot of mills still do this. They'll have just a series of men who are graders looking at every board and they'll, they'll grade it visually or ocularly. Um, this, is, this is all now done automatically by computer through this optimization. And you can see the dollar values are actually um, uh, estimated on there as well. So like you're looking at a two by four economy grade stud um, at $3.60 a board. This was taken quite a while ago. If you've been down to Holden Depot, you know these numbers have gone way up, but that kind of gives you an idea of how this, this automatic grader uh, can not only grade the log or the board, but give us kind of a value as well. Next slide. This is the planer trimmer optimizer. Uh, again, similar to the one in the sawmill, this will trim the board into the correct lengths based on that screen readout you see on the top um, left. Next slide. And this again is just a picture of that JSOR. Next slide. <clears throat> we have an automatic strapping station here. Um, so a unit will come out after it's been stacked up and this machine will uh, strap it uh, versus the old way of doing it by hand. It's pretty slick. Next slide. And then we have a wrapping station that wraps the lumber. Um, so it, it can withstand some weathering. Uh, a lot of times you'll see your retailers that you sell to, they stack their lumber outside and uh, may not sell it for months, you know. So you need some kind of protection to make sure it's not warping or getting uh, moisture in it. And that's why we wrap. Plus it's great advertising. Next slide. As we talked about, you know, byproducts uh, are a big part of, of sawmilling. What do you do with, with all your chips and broken pieces? Well, you grind them up. This is actually in the backside of the planer for planer shavings. Uh, we have collection points for chips, sawdust, planer shavings, and bark. And then we sell all those products to different byproducts users. Next slide. This is kind of a unique thing the family built for to help the truckers. You know, Colorado, we get a lot of weather. And so this is a neat deal they forgot to help the truckers who are hauling the lumber out to tarp their, their, uh, their loads. Just uh, makes it safer for them so they're not climbing up on there. This is all undercover and, and those straps there are hoists. They can just pull that tarp right over that load and strap her down and they're on their way. And that was about $100,000. Next slide. So the fire suppression system was added very early on. This mill did not have a sprinkler system. Um, it was uh, put together at a cost of about a million dollars. Next slide. Utilization in dead wood is really a challenge and that's where optimization really helped us. This is just shows you a six inch top, which is our smallest diameter of log we can cut. And what you're looking at, uh, picturing uh, two two by fours could be cut out of that log. Now, but optimization, you you can turn that log to see what the crack is. If the crack was standing straight, you know, you would you would just uh, lose one of those boards. But by being able to read the log, turn it, and then kind of orient it so that you can miss that crack, you can put two two by fours. Out. Next slide. These are some of the real beauties that we've been hauling in here for the last 12 years. Um, optimization is nearly impossible if you have sweep or spiral grain. And uh, a lot of this spruce does develop those spiral cracks, you know, over time as it dries out on the stump. And you can see, see that one in the middle on the right. That's pretty extreme. Should have left that one in the woods. Next slide. Well, we convinced the Forest Service to let us go as this wood became more and more uh, dead, which was just uh, getting older, to go to a seven inch top. And you can see that that helped, that can help a little bit in utilization. It made a big difference in the mill going to a seven inch top versus a six on the dead. We still go to a six inch top on green logs. Next slide. So that's the mill side. Um, we're just now beginning to dip our toe into logging ponderosa pine. Uh, we bought a forest service sale and we also bought 
this uh, timber from this private rancher down by Dolores. And this is kind of a picture of where we started there last fall, kind of the density of, of what we're dealing with there. There was a lot of concern about fire danger. If you've been through the San Juans National Forest and the pine type, you'll notice they're, they're very thick in places. Uh, the crowns are interlocking for the most part. But what's more dangerous, we feel, is that understory. It's just ladder fuels and it's mostly oak, brush oak. So this landowner was concerned. He needed to thin out his stand. Next slide. Next slide. So here, can't really see it, but you can see just one of our fellow bunchers cutting some trees out. We're thinning through this thing. Next slide. These are just deck logs that we've skidded in. And they've been processed and bucked and delimbed and ready to go to the mill. Next slide. Here you see some of the cleanup. Uh, this landowner is a cattle rancher. And what he was looking for was a, a real kind of a heavier thin than we would normally do on a uh, on say a forest service sale. But their their motivation here was to try to thin their forest out, get more sunlight to the forest floor, try to have us knock down as much brush as we could, and then they're going to grass seed the tar out of this thing and really try to get it for more pasture for their cattle. Next slide. This is a thin dairy after harvesting. Next slide. So here's before and after. Typically, the target, if you if you understand basal area, the forest on the, on the San Juan is trying to target their stands to to leave a residual stand somewhere between 50 and 70 basal area square feet per acre of, of residual trees. What you're looking at here is probably in that 20 to 30 basal area. We tried to leave what we felt were the better seed trees for the future. Um, Ponderosa pine really does not uh, wind throw very easily, but it will break in heavy woods. It's more of a brittle wood. So we're curious to see after this winter, this was done in the fall, if, if there was damage to these trees and then we can adjust our thinning uh, accordingly. Uh, next slide. So what you're looking at is probably the most expensive tree cut from the National Forest uh, in 2020. Um, this is the National Christmas tree. It was cut from the Geomug National Forest. I thought I'd throw this in at the end because two of my loggers, uh, Perry Brandt and Harvey Gray, who live in the Montrose in Olathe area, had the honor and chosen to cut this tree. And it was, it was really something. So with that, I'll pass it on back to Rich and wait for some questions later. Thank you very much, Jim. That was an excellent presentation. And it's so cool to uh, hear about a private family and company investing in all those uh, outstanding upgrades to that mill. That's really, really remarkable. Thank you, Tim. Our next and our next and final speaker is Laura Lee Nye, and she's the chair of the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition Executive Board. And Laura Lee has been actively involved for many years in water resource and water infrastructure issues. She was the chair of the Yavapai Water Advisory Committee and currently serves as chair of the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition and chair of the Northern Arizona Municipal Water Users Association. Of critical importance to Laura Lee is to ensure long-term water supplies for the town and region. And the town is Prescott Valley in central Arizona. A vocal proponent of improving forest health through sustainable restoration and development of a forest products industry in Yavapai County. She was instrumental in development of Juniper Works, the marketing and public relations arm of the coalition's Forest Health Initiative. Thank you, Laura Lee, for presenting today. Hey, Laura Lee, if you can hear me, We don't have any audio, Laura Lee.
Laura Lee, this is this is Damon. Um, you might want to check on the the button in the lower left that says mute. There's a little triangle. If you click on that, there's some audio settings. Um, you might be able to increase your output level for your volume there. Try that. Can you hear us now? There you go. We can hear you. Okay. Yay! <laughs> well, I have to give you a little background. I have been freaking out about the technology. So I, I probably, my bad vibes caught up with it. Thanks, Rich. I appreciate so much your comments. And of course, I want to thank the Institute for inviting us to this webinar today. Um, I'm going to shorten our name to the coalition because it's just too much of a tongue tangler otherwise. And the coalition is dealing with a tree of a different color because we are working with juniper. However, as my sign says back there, juniper works. In our quest to restore our watershed and grasslands, reduce erosion, and to hopefully allow more water to reach the aquifer. It became apparent that we would be involved in forest product utilization. So we entered into an interesting learning curve to develop biomass into a viable product and it's called biochar. The Upper Verde Watershed Protection Coalition uh, I'm sorry, I should have said advanced this line. Uh, was established in 2006, and we have we have established a formal partnership between local governments that include the towns of Prescott Valley and Chino Valley, Yavapai County, the city of Prescott, and the Yavapai Indian Tribe located in the Upper Verde watershed, which is in Yavapai County of Central Arizona. The brand was established by the Upper Verde River Watershed Protection Coalition, and it is our lowest forest products marketing arm. I should have said local. It's designed to promote the market potential of an underutilized wood species. Collaboration, of course, has been critical to our success. That includes landowners, business owners, it's local, state, federal agencies, nonprofits, citizens. The service of common goals are rural economic development, restore historic grasslands, sustainably manage juniper woodlands, and of course, reduce risk of wildfire. It's a protect water supplies. No one will question us about that one, will they? I want to talk to you a little bit about the steps we utilize for planning and research. We developed a watershed plan that engaged stakeholders, we did develop partnerships. We conducted scenario planning. We uh, quantified the wood supply. And to give you a couple of facts about that, uh, our wood supply is almost evenly split between federal and private land. About 25% of our uh, land is 
state trust fund. We analyzed the labor market. We studied feasibility of biomass markets and most appropriate technologies for our wood supply. Here are some of our market-based solutions. A restoration goal of 20,000 acres per year. We, of course, will address pressing environmental concerns, public-private partnerships, which we all call 3P, and wood, pro wood products practices are as follows. Juniper, juniper chip wattles. Juniper wattles with biochar. And of course, we have to make biochar. And one of my favorites is juniper silt dams. Next slide. Um, we're going to talk about juniper chip wattles now. And I'm going to show you one right quick. Up close and personal is <laughs> juniper chip wattle. And of course, the purpose for them are stormwater management. And I'm happy to tell you that they probably will replace traditional hay wattles. Our environmental concerns were handled by erosion, recharge, soil, profile degradation, and of course, we have potential markets, and they are as follows. Working agricultural land, public land, construction road building, environmental engineering and consulting firms. Let's talk a little bit about the advantages and benefits over hay wattles. They have a longer life. Juniper is a better filter. Juniper is not an irrigated crop. Juniper is local. And again, I have a favorite. Uh, the cattle on our rangeland uh, like to kick our hay wattles over and eat the hay. Well, they don't like the juniper. Juniper chip wattles are infused with juniper biochar. The purposes are stormwater management, contaminant filtration, and of course, we're going to address environmental concerns. That would be the leaching of heavy metals from mines, quarries, even the contaminants in surface water. Well, we're all looking for potential markets. So ours are working and abandoned open pit mines and quarries, government nonprofits, environmental engineering and consulting firms. And it's obvious, but I want to state it all the same. The benefit of adding biochar to waters, wattles, is increased filtration capacity. And I'm rushing because I want to try to stay in the promised time. Let's talk a little bit about juniper biochar. The purpose is soil amendment, contaminant filtration, the environmental concerns are addressed in this manner. The leaching of heavy metals from mines, quarries, and we repeated before, contaminants in surface water, soil profile degradation, and again, water conservation. Now, the po potential markets for this are farmers and ranchers, golf courses, parks, open space, environmental engineering and consulting firms, open pit mines and quarries, um, and Juniper is an excellent filter. It produces biochar with 100, I'm sorry, 80% or higher carbon content. And you'll notice the little pictures on the slide there, you see the before product, and then the black is the finished biochar. Here's some of my favorites. This is juniper silt dams. And the purpose is to address severe erosion and promote recharge into our aquifer. 
our environmental concerns are increased erosion to, to juniper overgrowth. Then let's talk about potential markets, primarily designed for working agricultural land. Now, an improved NRCS practice to support grassland restoration. The benefits of juniper silt dams are mitigate erosion, slow water to allow greater infiltration, and it's built on site with material readily available. Of uh, advanced slide, here is a picture of before and after construction building a silt dam. You'll see the uh, picture on the left. You see the juniper tree that is laying close to that erosion. Well, if you look at the bottom picture <clears throat> on, on the right, that's taking the juniper and utilizing rock and creating a silt dam. So I, I kind of nag everybody when we're tearing out and showing off our silt dams that nature is helping nature, and that happens to be a fact. What are some of our next steps? We are going to continue aware to build awareness of and market our Juniper Works brand. Broad-scale implementation, which will be assisted with a $6 million in grant from the NRCS to implement practices across the watershed. Economic development to support forest products industries considering location to the watershed. And yes, we have some. It is of note that there are only three of us managing these efforts. I want to give kudos to Melody Reisnyder, our grant project manager extraordinaire. She's going to be really mad at me for doing this. And likewise, John Munderlo, he's the coalition tax chair, and he is the water manager for Prescott Valley, Arizona. And he just happens to be a walking, talking water encyclopedia. So that's the second one that's come and get me, folks. Oh, no. And of course, <laughs> myself as chair of the coalition. I want to thank you all of you for your perseverance while we solved our sound issues. And that concludes the presentation. And I do welcome questions. Thank you so much, Laura Lee. That was an excellent presentation. And uh, just wanted to point out in Laura Lee's slide there that showed that the silt dams, that was in fact a Ponzi forwarder that was using yeah. um, recently cut juniper and uh, basically creating silt dams in the outbound to the, the pile. So one of the things about the coalition is that they really continue on. They've got legs under it and they're building on successes as they go forward. I um, wanted to point out that uh, James Gaspard got a number of questions and has been busy working, as has Tim Kylo, answering those. Uh, thank okay. you all. I don't know, James, if you saw that question from the um, about arsenic and the Hopi water um, system. Yeah, I, I answered it as yeah. well. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, and I'm assuming anybody that anybody can access those questions and click yep. on the answers. Yeah, yeah. But if anybody has so, any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them if you get them, Rich. Yeah, thank you so much for both you, James and Tim. Uh, Laura Lee, um, a question from is, uh, where is your biggest market? Are you able to sell to the U.S. Forest Service? I, I have a, I have my extraordinaire here. I'm going to, I would say yes. Well, we don't know if we can sell the U.S. Forest Service or not. Um, our biggest market is going to be the abandoned mines and quarries and the working mines and quarries in Arizona for the wattles, um, the juniper chip wattles and biochar, or even just the juniper chip wattles. 
um, mines have, they bought, the amount of bottles that mines buy are you, it's ubiquitous. I mean, yeah. everywhere. They buy thousands and thousands of feet of bottles a year. Yeah. Um, the issue becomes is that they are more expensive than traditional hay bottles, but with the right configuration of chips and um, the stock material that everybody sees on the side of the road when they have road cuts, if they use the correct mesh and the correct sock material, these things will last about five years. So we should be able to offset the cost. And like I said before, the cattle don't kick them open and eat it. They don't. <laughs> Thank you. Next question. Those are all the questions we have in our Q&A box. Um, that was Melody Rice Snyder that you heard but didn't see. Thanks, Melody, for answering that question. She, if I, if I put her on camera, my life would be shortened. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all. And uh, James and Tim and Laura Lee, we really value your presentations and uh, your investment in, in this excellent seminar. With that, I will pass it back to Damon. Actually, guys. We still have uh, another couple of minutes in this panel. Do you think it'd be worth going over some of the questions that were answered in Q&A, or, or should we just uh, wrap it up? What do you think, Rich? Oh, we certainly could. Um, yeah, maybe maybe um, they've been answered by text, but I don't know if all the participants um, can can scroll through them and read them. So maybe we could uh, ask yeah. them live to some of the presenters. Sure, and I, that's a great idea. So um, a question for uh, James is: uh, Have you investigated using your biochar for carbon sequestration? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we're just trying to figure out the best deal. Um, we're negotiating with some major, major corporations on major carbon credit purchases, and we're just negotiating one against the other. And but yeah, no, it it's a very good use of it. And at 808, actually, the reason they reimburse is because it's carbon sequestration in the soil. But we have a you know, we also qualify for different things on markets, especially in Europe and places like that. But yeah, no, that's one benefit, one benefit. Before the election, you couldn't give them away. After the election, the future have gone nuts. <laughs> Thank you. Another question for you, James. Uh, how will the recent fires in Northern Colorado affect your feedstock options? Oh, it's crippled us, but it, we can actually, it, it's turning around now because we had over 2,000 log trucks uh, of beetle kill. There were stewardship contracts that were just about to start, and they put the damn fire line north of the stewardship contracts. So all our trees burned up. So now we're just contracting to bring in the charred trees. We can use the mm -hmm. charred trees. That's why I've been flying around the country. I've walked the fire scars in Oregon, Northern California, up at the Cameron Peak. Uh, so now we're basically making a point of specializing in charred trees. Very good. A couple more questions, James. Does your product filter out arsenic in public water systems? And then a follow on, what happens with the biochar after they have captured pollutants? Uh, to answer your questions, uh, the yes on the arsenic, we filter out that. In fact, I didn't mention it in my presentation, but the... Uh, Desert Research Institute just published a study of our carbon. Uh, it was for, done for Reno and Vegas water districts. We outperformed the incumbent activated carbon by a, over 25 times. So, you know, if you make good carbon, it has unique products. Uh, pro and plus, you know, the beetle kill makes a good feedstock. Uh, so now what you do afterwards, it depends on the remediation project you're on. Uh, most of our remediation projects are what's called in situ remediations. Uh, the EPA has done years and years of animal studies with our carbon, because like at the river with DuPont, we're binding mercury. The question was, what happens if an earthworm, and they leave the stuff in place and walk away because of our long lifetime. And that's just, they declare it clean. 
but the question was, what happens if a uh, earthworm eats the char and a fish eats the worm, a bird eats the fish? But they did years of animal studies and our carbon actually maintains the toxins inside the carbon through the digestive system of animals. So they allow us to leave our product in situ, which means in place. And if you take a filter, I mean, you know, if you're pulling a filter out, there's a several different, it depends what's in it and how you dispose of it. Yeah. But where our nutrients, Very good. like we do our lake treatments, our, we're picking up nutrients, the cities or whoever owns the lake pulls it back out of the lake and puts it in their landscaping to get a cascading effect where they're basically, you know, getting freebie in their landscaping from paying to clean up the lake. Very good. One last one, James. Um, doesn't the, uh, the 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 process create uh, of the of the char manufacturing uh, produce um, like pollutants out the stack, carbon monoxide, etc.? Uh, we actually have spent tens of millions of dollars developing our patented emission control system. We have fourteen patents on our system, um, so we're extremely clean. In fact, in North Carolina, we have a permit there to burn treated wood and we can burn 420 kilns at a time. We're extremely, we, we basically break down all the pollutants in our emission control stack into elemental molecules. Uh, now our competitors don't meet such standards, but you know, it is what it is. The industry will shake out. So as far as our company, we're extremely clean and we meet all, all emission standards and we can burn hundreds and hundreds of kilns and stay within what's called synthetic miners, which are the permits that don't even require public hearings. Very good, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kylo, has the Forest Service in Colorado committed to a certain amount of volume to be sold each year? That's a great question. Um, there are so many moving parts to that. Uh, typically the Forest Service will come up with what's called an annual sale quantity based on their forest plans. Um, in the case of like the Geomug National Forest, they are selling somewhere in the neighborhood of 60,000 uh, units or 30 million board feet a year annually, which is a pretty good uh, San Juan is a little better, somewhere between 65,000 and 80,000 CCF per year. Those are our two big sourcing areas going forward. So we feel pretty comfortable with those targets, but as you know, Many factors can change um, timber management. One of them is is uh, politics, and I guess we'll see going forward. There is no uh, locked in uh, volume guarantees, though. And another question, Tim: uh, You use natural gas to heat your kilns. Have you looked into using biomass heat instead? Yes. Um, we actually were permitted to put in a uh, wood-fired cogen facility here. Uh, unfortunately, we sit right on the outskirts of, of Montrose, which is a growing community, and we're always very concerned about emissions. Um, you're very highly regulated by the DEQ and EPA when it comes to wood-fired uh, emissions control. We've done the math, and it just feels like it, it's cheaper to go with the natural gas. One thing I my presentation though is that we just pulled the pin on starting to construct a pellet mill here which will really help us in our turn sawdust and wood uh, uh, wood chips and and whatever and it's going to probably take a year or two to get that project up and running so but we're trying to kind of handle our own products that way hmm. very good and a question for Laura Lee uh, juniper is a prime source of fuel wood for heating and cooking on native reservations and, gen and in the general population. How much of an impact or competition to public needs, if any, do, does the Juniper Works kind of initiative pose? And also, pinon is in abundance throughout the Southwest, and is that a viable source for your products? And you need to unmute, Laura Lee.
We got you now. Okay. All right. Thank you. I was going to say I was I was unmuted from this end. <laughs> Rich, can you help me? <laughs> You're good. Well, no, we're not. We're not forestry. What do they mean by the pinion pinion question? Um, so pinion pine, which is oftentimes grows with juniper in a lot yeah. of the woodlands yeah. in the southwest, is that a viable uh, species for wattles? And what? then the other question yeah. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you well? Yeah, we believe in it. Yes, it is. We have been focused on juniper because um, pine is part of our watershed, but is a small portion of the actual wood supply. Yeah. So we have been we have been focusing on grasslands restoration in our woodlands, um, which is the home of our future water supply as well. So that has been our focus. We have not spent a lot of time um, working in what would be the Hacienda district of the Prescott National Forest in uh, the pine in in the timberlands because we don't have a lot of them. That little sample that I held up of the bio char before and after that was pine, pinion pine. And then the other part of the question, Laura Lee, is what competition does the Juniper Works Initiative pose to like uh, local use for heating and firewood and that kind of thing, if any? It, yeah, it doesn't. Um, we have no, um, firewood is a very large market for us already. Yeah. And what we're doing doesn't um, compete with it at all. No. Um, you know, the, the restoration level here is between 20 and 27,000 7, acres a year. Um, and we have a way to go till we get there. So uh, there, there's no competition. We like people using it for firewood. We think that's yes, great. Yes, we encourage it. <laughs> In fact, there there's, a little, there's a little fun fact totem. They make jewelry out of juniper here. I have hmm. a necklace made out of juniper. <laughs> nice. Well, thank you very much, Laura Lee and Melody, off to the side. And with that, Damon, I think we've uh, had our panelists answer all the questions that were posed. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura Lee. Excellent. Um, thank you, Rich, and, and thank you all the panelists. Um, if you all turn off your videos, then you'll, you'll disappear from the screen and we'll do some, some closing remarks. Nothing works. Ready to go. And it wasn't your fault either. There was them. All right. So, um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, I want to give a huge thanks to all the speakers that um, donated their time and their expertise and, and gave the excellent presentations. Um, and I want to thank all of you. I, as Han mentioned yesterday, we, we don't have a lot of experience putting on virtual conferences. So we definitely appreciate you going out on a limb and uh, testing this one out. We had really good turnout, uh, really good questions and dis discussion. So um, yeah, it's been good. Just have a couple of final housekeeping notes and then I'll um, bring the rest of the wood utilization team up on the screen. So uh, as a reminder, if you want continuing forestry education credits from SAF, um, go ahead and type your name and CFE into the chat. Um, if you've done it before, you don't need to do it again. Um, we'll make sure to get those credits to you. We will share the contact info for all the present presenters from the seminar um, within about a week. Uh, so if you had questions that you asked or and didn't get answered or you wanted to ask, um, you can follow up with them. And we also did record all the sections, so they'll be posted to our website. And um, We'll share the links with all those that registered pretty shortly here. Um, but if you just go to the Ecological Restoration Institute website, um, you can also find them that way once we put them up, which will be in a couple of days. And uh, with that, I'll ask the rest of the team to, to turn on their videos and they'll pop up on the screen here. And um, just wanted to say that um, the South, the Swery util Wood Utilization Team um, will be putting on events similar to this about twice a year. So the next one will be in fall of 2021. 
And um, we're happy you all joined us today and hopefully you'll, you'll keep an eye out for, for future events. So um, big thank you from, from all of us that are on the screen here. And uh, that, that concludes the, uh, our seminar today. Thanks everyone.